Am I making this up? But uh, in any case, um, Dennis and I were in cut and try mode, and uh, we would we were doing anything that we could. We ourselves had become very sensitive instruments to altered states of consciousness. Bob drilled us going you know, down to that pulsation state, out of body and back up and back down and, and so on. We did that thousands of times, so we'd be very sensitive to the altered states and the pathway in between them. That was uh, the first part of our training. So Dennis and I were very sensitive to our consciousness and, all, and what state it was in at that time. So we'd do things, well, we crawled in, um, in pyramids, you know, aluminum pyramids, because a book was out that said, you know, inside a pyramid oriented with the, you know, you could get different, um, you know, uh, altered states. Everything that was ever published, you know, we tried to read on the subject. So we'd go into pyramids and see what it did to us because we were very sensitive. I stuck my head between two big capacitor plates with a couple hundred thousand volts on them to <laughs> see whether or not we could oscillate the pineal gland because we had read back in the Muldoon and Carrington days that they thought it had to do with the pineal gland and we thought, well, and we knew it had to do with four hertz because Bob, and we did too, when we got in that pulsation state. Uh, you'd get this around four hertz vibration going on. So we knew that was physical because once we outfitted the lab with GSR, we could actually see that little GSR meter sit there and oscillate at four hertz. So it wasn't just a perception of consciousness. There was something physiological going on that was oscillating at four hertz. So those were our only keys. Um, so we were cutting and trying everything. Uh, Dennis uh, went to visit some faith healers from the Dominican Republic and you know, see what he did. And each time we were using our body as the instrument and our mind as the instrument of how did it affect our consciousness, looking for tools. Okay, well that, um, that went on for uh, a year or so and we were unsuccessful in finding appropriate tools. And one day while uh, I was at work and Dennis and I worked at the same place, uh, Dennis came by, he, he gave me some papers and said, take a look at this, you know, maybe we can use it out at the lab. So I looked at it, and it was an article by Oster about binaural beats. And in that article, it mentioned that it was thought that binaural beats might entrain EEG, might entrain brain waves. So that sounded pretty interesting. So we thought, yeah, well, let's give it a try. I mean, we were trying everything. And uh, unfortunately, the, the very uh, few days after that, Dennis uh, had to uh, leave the country with his, his job, took him out of the country for about a month. And when he came back, um, he went to the... Uh, uh, double E lab, he was a double E, and uh, went to the double E lab at University of Virginia, borrowed some equipment, made a binaural beat tape. It was a very uh, nicely done tape. He started out at Alpha and went down, or started out yeah, at Alpha, stepped down, you know, small steps at a time, down to the theta region at the four hertz, stayed there for an hour or two and stepped back up. And um, we vowed we'd go out to the lab our first opportunity. Well, it was good timing, actually. Bob was out of town. He was out of town for two weeks, so that gave us lots of time to play in, in the lab and, uh, because we would rather be in the, in, the, in the bed being instructed by Bob than we would be actually doing research on our own. So this gave us time to play around, and uh, we went out, we put that uh, binaural beat tape on, and we listened to it, and there it just stepped us down. We followed it. We, we didn't try to do anything with it. Just listen. And we could tell from our consciousness, it would just drop us, and we could tell when that would go down one hertz, it would drop. We could feel every step of the way. It was like walking down a pair of steps. Then it put us in that uh, theta state, held us there without any effort on our part, and stepped us right back up again. And we both got out of that, those, those beds and looked at each other and said, wow, that really worked for me. Did it work for you? You know, and we agreed that it did. And we were uh, very excited about that. And for the next week and a half, while Bob was gone, what we did was try to optimize it. We tried different base frequencies. We tried different waveforms. Besides the sine wave, we put in triangular waves and square waves and all kinds of other things. Uh, we tried uh, different uh, volumes and intensities. And so by the time Bob came back, we had what we thought was a pretty good, uh, a pretty good sound, and it was very effective. We told Bob about it, and actually Bob, I think, was even more excited than we were. Um, because he had the bigger picture. I mean, we were just young guys in a lab, and he kind of saw where maybe this, this would go. So the next step was to determine whether or not it was just us. You know, we weren't exactly normal anymore. We'd been doing this with Bob for a, for a year and a half, and we were very sensitive in our consciousness. You know, we knew how to get down and get in that theta state and get out of body and that sort of thing very routinely. So we weren't just the average person, but we had to know, would it affect the average person, or was it just us because of all the training we had had? So the next thing was to get people in there who were naive subjects, if you will, and Dennis and I brought our, our wives, and we brought our children, 
and uh, we brought our friends and neighbors and anyone we could, and we didn't tell them anything. We just said, listen to this, and then describe what happens, you know, what, what happens with your mind. Just listen to it. And um, Bob was doing the same thing. Everybody that passed through Whistlefield, and in those days, people were constantly passing through Whistlefield. Bob was like a hub of interest in the larger reality. And he would snatch all of them, get them up to the lab, and have them, you know, listen to this and see what, see what you think. Well, after a couple of months of trying this on naive subjects, we found that it affected everyone. Now, everyone didn't go out of body. It depends a whole lot on what you bring to it. Some people, as soon as you'd get down to that theta level, they would just lose consciousness, just snap, they were gone. And as soon as they stepped back out of it, snap, they were awake again. And they'd say, oh, I fell asleep. Well, they didn't really fall asleep. They weren't tired. You know, they, this, they just lost consciousness. But it did affect everybody. So uh, we knew we had something to pursue. And what we needed then was a real experiment. Some people that we could run through the paces, naive subjects again. So Bob called up some of his friends and passed the word around that he had a technology that was uh, effective in, uh, in helping one go out of body. And he got overwhelmed with, with uh, responses. He booked the Tuckahoe Motel, which is a little motel over on Route 250. At that time, it, was, it had already seen its heyday and was a little bit dilapidated, run down, little motel. I think it had maybe 20 20 units, just one rectangular building with 10 doors on either side. And um, he booked the whole motel. And we had then about two or three weeks to get ready for 20 people that we were going to be our lab rats and we were going to run them through a program. Now, Bob wanted to know what could this do? Where did this, this putting them in this state, what did it allow them to do? So he, his job was to produce the program. And he produced a program that had them... Um, Oh, you know, looking in envelopes, reading numbers, seeing pictures, remote viewing. We had targets laid out. Uh, they were healing. They were, they were, you know, visiting relatives. They were uh, doing just anything you could imagine, you know, that, that uh, he could think of. We just wanted to know what happened. You know, with, with, these are people that probably had been doing some of this stuff anyway, but what difference would it make now that they were listening to the sound? So we had this seminar, and um, uh, by that time, Nancy Lee had joined us. And uh, Nancy Lee had come in probably about the last month or so of that. She just graduated from college. And um, she was the organizer. She organized this whole thing, got people's travel arrangements, picked them up at the airport, got all the logistics, you know, the refreshments, everything. So she was the organizer. Bob was busy doing the program. And Dennis and Bill Yost and I were in Bill Yost's garage trying to build equipment so we could put sound for two people in 20 rooms and GSR on all of them so we could keep track of what it is was going on uh, with their bodies. And that was a rush. As the people started arriving, Dennis and I were still in the closets of the motel rooms, you know, soldering wires. <laughs> Nancy Lee was in, a, was in a, 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 a Twitter because, you know, everything, of course, at the last minute happens all at the same time, and she was organizing it all. And Bob was probably the only one that, uh, you know, was uh, serene, but he was putting the the, edge, the, the final touches on his program. Well, the people came, they, they got in their, their beds, they put on their headphones, and for a, a, two days, for the weekend, it was the, it was the most paranormal things that I'd ever seen happen, you know, at, at one time. There were, one of the things you had them do was shining their, their energy beams light up in the sky, and we'd go outside and see if we could see the lights in the sky, you know. And <laughs> there were lights in the sky, and there were more paranormal experiences. There were, you know, these people got out of body, they made contacts, they, they, they read things in the envelopes, they saw the pictures, and uh, we had some very good hits that way. So it was just a phenomenal weekend. And about that time, I think Bob started to think, hmm, you know, I think we've got something. And there's enough interest that perhaps we can develop this and it'll even pay for itself. Up to that time, Bob paid for everything. You know, he built the lab, you know, he, he paid for the equipment, he paid for the, for the uh, components that we put together. So it was all out of his pocket up to that point. And uh, I think he was looking for a way to expand that so more people could get involved. So then we held a few more of these seminars at the Tuckahoe since we had that building wired. And uh, <clears throat> we decided to make use of it. And there were three or four more held there. And uh, matter of fact, um, the next speaker, uh, the first speaker this afternoon, uh, Joseph Pierce, he came to one of those additional seminars. So you'll have somebody here that uh, was there at the Tuckahoe. <laughs>